And this thing has evolved over time. We see uh, back when I was in school, it was thought to be around 6 8%. Uh, Mirren Prescott did a famous thing on the equity premium puzzle. Most researchers find it's too large for standard models, and they estimated it at 6.2%. This was back in 86. Um, but estimates in the early 90s were often around 8%. Uh, C. Barclays and CSFB estimated 8 Ibbotson, which is very influential, had about almost 9 uh, Finance texts in, in 1998 averaged 8.5%. Uh, Evo Welch did a survey in 1998. He had 8.5%, so it was huge. Then we had the crash. The market went way down from 2000 to 2002. Boom. Well, <laughs> uh, funny, uh, the uh, AIMR had, uh, which is like some investment uh, journal, had, uh, they, they had a bunch of uh, esteemed economists on there, and they had a forward-looking uh, equity risk premium of 3%. Uh, the Wall Street Journal survey in 2005 was like around 2%. CFO Magazine 2005 was around 5 Eva Evo Welch survey, the most recent one, is, is, well, he says the limits of this debate say you have to be between 1% and 8% to be a reasonable estimate, he would say. And he would say that the, uh, it's anyone can, can between 2 and 4% is the more reasonable. Uh, and so he's done a lot of work in, on the surveys of this. And so, so I'm going to be unreasonable and say it's less than 1%. And, and now, people ignore costs all the time. Uh, if you know people that go to Vegas, usually they say, how much did you lose? Ah, a little bit. Uh, not too much. Uh, but they're underestimating how much they really lost. Everyone tends to do that. It's uh, why, why dwell on your losses? Uh, uh, Beardstown Ladies Investment Club uh, was famous. They had five folksy books in the 90s where they'd give out uh, uh, cooking recipes and, and um, uh, investment advice. And they advertised themselves as having, over this 11-year uh, period, a return of 23.4%, which is great. And, and so best-selling authors, everything was great. Uh, but then some, some reporter from uh, Chicago audited their financials, and he found that their return was 9.1% annualized. That's a big miss. So how did they miss 15%? How in the world? Well, they failed to include the contribution. So when they were putting money in every year, they, they didn't count that. Um, you would think you would count this, but when you get the result you like, uh, it's not nice to harp on the fact that you actually underperformed the market by 6% annualized, as opposed to beating it by 9%. Uh, it's human nature. Let's look at the first easy uh, adjustment you should make to the risk premium. Geometric versus arithmetic averaging. Now, if the stock goes up from 1 to 2 to 1, so it starts here, goes here, goes here, well, you, you ended up where you started out, so you have a return of zero. Uh, that's the, the actual real return. Um, but arithmetically, you had 100% return the first period and a negative 50% return the second period, the average of which is negative 25%. So that gets us back to that small cap effect. Remember, uh, looking at daily data greatly exaggerated it. Um, so it just depends on when you rebalance. But uh, in general, there's a mathematical adjustment. You take the arithmetic return and subtract off the variance divided by 2, and you'll get the geometric return. It's a good approximation. Uh, and so average stock return have volatility around 20% for average stock index in the world. And if you take 20% squared divided by 2, you get a number of around 2%. So if people are using arithmetic averages, and in, in previous uh, videos I, I always refer to the arithmetic average, uh, this suggests you should at least take off 2% off the top for this business here. Um, the post-World War II price earnings dividend uh, yield decline is, is interesting. Uh, the dividend yield went from about 7% to 2% uh, from the beginning of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century in the U.S. And if the dividend rate goes down, there's a one-time capital gain. And as your returns are dividends plus capital gain, that's a one-time boost to stock market, a huge boost as you go from 7% uh, to, to, to 2%. And Fama French estimate that this contributed about 4% to the post-World War II return uh, on the equity index. And so that's why Fama and French have a forward-looking equity premium of around 3.5% lower than those 6%, because they're, they're making this adjustment because they think that's a one-time effect. And the U.S. does dominate a lot of the data points, uh, so that's an interesting adjustment. 
Then there's also bad market timing. Uh, Ilya Daichev found that, um, well, you can look at a time series and it doesn't have an unambiguous uh, uh, return. It depends when the money goes in. Because if you put in a dollar at the beginning, period one, so you have negative a dollar that goes out the door. In period two, it goes up to two, but you're not taking it out, you're not putting any in. Then it goes back down to one. Well, now you get your dollar back, so you made zero. But if you put in money in period one, in period two, and then got it back in period three, then the cash flows are negative one, negative one, plus one and a half for an annualized, or period annualized return of negative 17.7. So very different. Uh, total return is different uh, than the internal rate of return based on the timing of the investments. And what Daichev found was that the distributions uh, generated from the stock market which are dividends minus new money, uh, is people are really bad with their market timing. The correlation between distributions and the future return is positive. So, so in other words, distributions are high, meaning new money is low, um, and money going into the market is low, when the, the return is going to be high in the future. So people are bad at market timing there. Uh, but they, they pump money into the market right after returns are high. So. Uh, if, if, if the market goes up, that's good for IPOs and SEOs, and that's consistent with our intuition. Um, it's bad. Uh, transaction costs are very important. Uh, up through the 70s, you actually had to pay an 8.5% load to buy a mutual fund. Uh, and so that's, that's a huge uh, hit. Uh, even today, many mutual funds have loads this high. Um, not as many, but uh, all of them did until the 70s. So for most of the 20th century, you had a huge cost to get into this diversified vehicle. Uh, also, the bid ask cross, uh, that stocks were often quoted uh, in quarter increments until the, until the late 90s. So, you know, it, it, the bid ask would be eight and three quarters to nine, which means you buy at nine and you sell at eight and three quarters if the price didn't move. So you'd lose 2.78 percent if the price didn't move. And this is a phantom cost. Most investors don't even know it. All they, all they see is the commission. They don't account for the bid ask cross. Stolen Whaley estimated this is about 1.78%. Uh, this Bardwar and Brooks estimated 4.4% total cost. Wow, oh, that's huge. Uh, now, this can be very low if you're smart and use discounts, but let's just look at the average over most of the 20th century, because this is the data we're applying it to, and clearly 2% you know, is a reasonable estimate for these transaction costs. The transaction costs from market impact um, is something most people ignore also. Uh, I have proprietary data from when I worked at a hedge fund, Deep Haven, and because it is now extinct, I can tell you all about it. Uh, and what I would do is I, I generated like 10,000 observations based on trading of my portfolio, and you'd look at the fill price you'd get. So you trade this over the day, and you'd use an algorithm. We used uh, you know, algorithms, uh, direct market impacts. You, you, you'd have a computer doing this. And try to be smart and buy at the bid minus the penny and things of that nature. Uh, well, I, I compare my fill price to the price at the open because the price at the open of the stock market was the price before the market knew I was going to trade. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing here in, in Minnesota. And I, and I compared the fill price to the price at the open. Uh, and generally what I found was it was about 0.2% I paid uh, in terms of how much I moved the price. So if the price started at 100 uh, it would move up to 100.2 uh, based on that would be the average price I would buy at. And if it started at 100, when I sold it, I would sell it at, say, 99.8. Um, and uh, But w when I had to do a lot of average daily volume, you know, 1 to 10 percent, then, then the uh, costs went way up. Uh, so if you're a large institution, these are, these are big costs. And, and in fact, there's an inverse relationship between your commissions and your bid ask spread cost and your market impact. Because if you're a big firm, you're going to have sophisticated algorithms and you're going to have low commissions because you have such high volume. But you're going to have huge, uh, you're going to have much bigger market impact. Uh, but when you're a retail trader, you're going to have zero market impact, but it's, you, you don't have access to the sophisticated market algorithms and um, you, you end up crossing the bid ask spread. So you can't avoid transaction costs. 